Hey, hey, and welcome to the Melanin Wellness Podcast YouTube channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far, go ahead, click the like button on this video, go ahead and click that subscribe button because you're going to be catching more of these episodes as they premiere. And don't forget to turn on those notifications so you do not miss whenever a new episode is uploaded. There's so much more, so much more coming with the podcast. So thanks again for watching. And now let's get to the video. Hey y'all, I'm Karina Dunn, a speaker, a wellness influencer, and a all around total badass. But before I became any of that, I am a wife and a mom to my rambunctious crew of six. My house is so busy. <laughs> On my wellness journey, I discovered that I needed a space, not only to come out of my own introverted shell, but to share my own experiences with wellness and also gather the perspectives of others who are also walking this wellness journey. Welcome to the Melanin Wellness Podcast. My goodness, this year of 2022 is flying by so fast, y'all. Listen, I don't even know where the time has gone. We are in preparation for another year already. Fall always comes in like, oh my, I can't even describe the way it comes in, but all I know is I blink my eyes and it's gone. So I am hoping that when you listen to this episode, you have found yourself in an excellent place well, and you have started off your new year the way that you like. Today, I had the distinct pleasure of talking to Dr. Andrea. And listen, you guys, she is going to come and give us some of the most amazing tips. I remember when I read her bio, I was very, very excited about speaking with her because I knew that she had information that my wellness audience needed to hear. But before we get into our episode, you all know how we do here at the Melanin Wellness Podcast. We give our 30 seconds of gratitude and I like to allow my guests to go first. So Dr. Andrea, can you please share with us your gratitude? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm grateful for that, number one, but I'm also grateful that I am here to share some of the health and wellness um, tips and awareness and the journey that God has allowed me to be able to not only experience, but to be able to share and hopefully encourage some other families to do the same. Um, as many people may have heard before, health is wealth. And once you get your health in order, the wealthiness in that just starts to spread to other areas of your life. So I am thankful thankful for health and wellness and the ability to be able to share that with you and your audience today. Absolutely. That is so vital, guys. You heard that health is wealth. And so with that, I want to add my gratitude. I am so grateful for my good health because I know that this impending, you know, surgery that I have coming up will go well because I have been being well, taking care of myself in a better manner. I am so excited to be here with you all, with my guests. I'm so excited to be able to share my gifts and be able to have guests like Dr. Andrea come to the show to share with us I am grateful for the healthy whole foods that my family has access to. I am grateful for just waking up, opening my eyes, and being able to recognize myself in my mirror. Now, that may have been more than 30 seconds of gratitude. Probably was. 
But, <laughs> and y'all know what I say around here, you can never be grateful enough. So be grateful, live in a space of gratitude, because when you are in gratitude, you cannot operate from negativity. Those two things simply cannot coexist. So thank you, family. So let's get into our topic today. Today, we're going to be talking about what you don't know about your health can hurt you and five of the most important things to know about your family medical history. So Dr. Andrea, can you tell my audience a little more about yourself? Well, I'm Dr. Andrea. I'm a board certified family medicine doctor. And the whole goal of my platform is to help families build a health legacy so that you can improve those generational health outcomes. Um, that is super, super important. I have been in the clinic. Um, I've been in nursing home in different areas like that. Um, and I'm able to do that job there, but I want to go out into the community, speak on podcasts such as this, um, partner with some people to be able to remind people of why health and wellness is so important. There are so many times where I will see patients and, you know, we'll have the conversation, especially when they we discover that they have health issues that are a little more advanced. And a common thing that I was hearing was, you know, oh, if I would have known about this beforehand or, you know, if I had known that this is these are some things that I should have looked out for or, you know, this particular thing has run in my family. And, you know, I thought I was just bound to get it, you know, and not necessarily taking precautions whether that is, you know, watching your portions or getting exercise, which doesn't have to be difficult. It can be walking. You know, you can listen to a podcast or your favorite show or whatever while you do it. So that it doesn't feel so much so much like a task. So being able to hopefully put get the message out there about, you know, health checkups, things like that, so that we can hopefully prevent some of these things with, you know, things that don't necessarily have to cost a lot, like, you know, watching what you eat, the portions that you eat, and just, you know, even if you don't have a gym membership, going out there, walking around your neighborhood, walking around the track, you know, a lot of people have access to YouTube and different things like that. You may find somebody that you want to follow there. You know, it doesn't have to be a difficult process to incorporate health and wellness. So that's kind of where I am now. I absolutely agree with you. You know, it's so funny because as a therapeutic yoga instructor, I find that people think that wellness and exercise in particular has to be this Oh my goodness. It's almost like it's, it's, it's this overhaul of every little thing and every little piece right. of their lives. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I always tell people when we practice yoga together, meet yourself where you are. Nobody is saying you have to be out here looking like a bendy straw, just <laughs> bending yourself all over the place. Because let's be clear, not all of us can do that. Some days I can't do that. And you don't have to get on the mat. You can do yoga from a chair, which a lot of people don't know and didn't realize. And like you said, just walking, going outside and walking. Little known fact, walking actually burns just as many calories as running, except it just takes you a little longer to get there. So, right. you know, that's a little tidbit for you guys, you know, take it with you. <laughs> so right. tell us, did you always want to be a doctor? So actually, you know, it may sound a little cliche, but ever since I was a little girl, I had dreams of being a doctor, but it actually started where I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was, you know, a little girl, I think I may have been around six or seven. I was back in my, I grew up in rural Alabama. So, you know, a lot of times we would just make fun out of so many things. So when mm -hmm. I was a little girl, there were two other girls in the neighborhood. So we were playing on some old tree stumps. And I guess for us, thinking back on it at that time, maybe we may have treated each one as a stage, our own personal stage, I guess. So somehow in the midst of us playing, um, we got on the conversation of what we wanted to be when we grew up. So mm -hmm. everybody kind of went around talking about what they wanted to do. And when it got to me, I said, I wanted to be a nurse. So, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to be a nurse. 
So there was a young lady in my church who was, I found out later was in nursing school. So of course, you know, being a little girl, I was so excited because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is somebody that I look up to. You know, she always carried herself well. She was a little bit older. I don't have any big sisters or be, I'm the oldest. It's just a it's just me and my brother. And so being able to look up to someone who wanted to do something that I said I was going to do, I thought that was like the most amazing thing. So yeah. she, you know, so she was happy about that. And she told me, she said, well, have you ever thought about being a doctor? And, you know, for me, I was like, doctor, you know, I didn't know any doctors. Nobody in my family was a doctor. Of course, my family had a family doctor. Um, but when she said that, it just, you know, kind of got my wheels turning and I was like, well, okay, let me just think about it. So there was this older lady who used to be in our church. And so this particular Sunday um, after church, everybody went to the nursing home where she was. She was like one of the one of the older, um, well, I should say more seasoned women in the church who had transitioned to being in the nursing home. So we went there to have kind of like a mini service with her just to, you know, give her some encouragement. And mm -hmm. so she can see some familiar faces. And so afterwards, I was able to wheel her back to her chair back to her room in her wheelchair. So for me, again, at this age, I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing again. So I was <laughs> yeah. like, what if I, you know, I guess equivalent to what I may have been thinking at that time, like what if I could be her doctor or what could I, you know, possibly do um, in the position as a doctor? And so, you know, that kind of stuck with me. And I was, you know, you would see things on TV, you know, mm -hmm. you would, so I kind of started having more and more of an interest in it. And then as I got a little bit older, my dad had an, a health issue. And so at that particular time, um, I think I was in middle school, right before high school, and my mom had taken him to a doctor in the area, took him to an ER, and his belly had gotten like extremely large. Like he looked like he may have been like seven or eight months pregnant. And even, oh, even, wow. though, my dad was, even though my dad wasn't a thin guy, that was like totally abnormal for him. Mm -hmm. And he's the kind of guy who would just kind of, you know, he's always outside doing things, very active. And for him to slow down like that, we all knew that something was wrong. And so my mom took him to this particular doctor and to the ER and they told him it was just gas and, you know, go home, it'll pass. But, you know, for us, you know, we were like, this is just not like him. So she ended up taking him to another ER that was maybe a couple of hours away and they told him he had a ruptured appendix. So, at, and he survived and, you know, he had to have surgery and all of that. But for me, at that moment, it just solidified like, okay, I definitely not only need to go into medicine, but that just pushed me even more to say, you know, I want to be a part of the healthcare team that's kind of leading um, and making some of those major decisions. So at that right. point, you know, it just kind of clicked for me. I was like, you know, this is my daddy, you know, like I'm, I'm a daddy's girl and, you know, I'm just used to seeing him, you know, just in, in, you know, just being a dad in this powerful position as my, you know, for me as that right. for something to happen to him like that and knowing, you know, that it could have been, you know, a lot worse than it was. That was like, that was it. That solidified it for me. So how old were you when this particular defining moment happened? Because everybody always has that defining moment in their lives that that defines their path and lets them know this is exactly what I want to do. So how old were you when this occurred? I was in middle school. I would say maybe around 13 or so, maybe, okay. you know, kind of somewhere. I don't remember exactly, but I... I it was around maybe 13 or so. And I guess that just really, that was like a huge um, punch to me, you know, and I was just like, why? and like I said, don't get me wrong. I know that people can make mistakes. None of us are Absolutely. perfect, but, you know, thinking back, I don't think he was really given the attention that he should have. I don't know what right. the situation was there, but for me, it was just like, 
okay, I need to, you know, that's even like now with my patients, I treat them like family because I know what it feels when you feel like you're being overlooked or your condition is not really um, being taken as seriously as it should. So, right. you know, it that moment not only defined kind of my path for me, but it also, you know, now when I'm just people, not only just patients, but just people in general, you know, you want to make sure that people are heard and they know that what they're saying is important and, you know, their situation is important. And, you know, many times people may, may downplay it and say, oh, that's not that, that big of a deal, or, you know, this could be worse, but, you know, for that person in that moment, like it is a big deal. So, you know, we have to make sure we treat it as such so that they will feel her and they'll open up and they can get the best treatment that they need. Absolutely. Because now, I want to ask a question and this, this question might seem, um, kind of, um, I don't know how it's going to seem. And at this point, I don't care. I'm just going to ask it. <laughs> Do you feel like, you know, you said that you grew up in rural Alabama. Do you feel mm -hmm. like that perhaps his race played any part in that? Because we are all aware of the statistics that have come out about the disparities in rate in, in getting medical care for African Americans and people of color. Do you feel like that that may have played any part in your father's initial diagnosis? Well, I can say I was not there when my mom took him to the ER. So I didn't mm. get a chance to necessarily witness the interaction. Okay. But, you know, looking at the way things are today, you know, and, and what, you know, different things that are coming out today with different situation, it's very possible that that could have played a part. Now, do I know that for sure? Not necessarily, but looking at some of the things that we're going through right now, it's very possible, you know. Okay. I'm just yeah. happy, you know, that my mom, you know, did not just settle for that. And she, you know, she was just like, this is not what we're all used to. And she listened to her gut and she was like, no. We need to go further to get a second opinion because he wasn't getting any better, you know. So I feel like um, that's a lesson, not just for me and my family, but for anybody. If you feel like that, you know, things just don't seem right, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask, you know, well, how long, you know, should I allow this to go on before mm -hmm. I do something else? Like, don't leave without your questions answered. Because that one question, that one answer to your question can change the way that you handle yourself when you leave and it can make a huge difference in your outcome. So that is that is one big thing. Don't be afraid to speak up for yourself. And, it, and I don't mean that you have to get into an argument, you know, right. or say mean, disrespectful things. But if you have a concern, I would rather you ask about it, um, even if it's just down to, you know, where should I start with exercise? Because, you know, if you feel like, you know, I haven't done anything um i don't even know where to start like even something as simple as that it's okay to ask questions but because at the end of the day you want to make sure that you're taken care of and things that you need to do to go on with life and live a long healthy life you know we're able to address those so that you you're you're being able to stay as healthy as possible absolutely because this is your health and you only get one life and right. so um, you can't afford to be quiet about your health or even your loved one's health. So, you know, pivoting off of that a little bit, why do you think that having discussions about family medical history and about our health is so hush hush in the black community? I think that some people, I, I had this conversation with someone else. A lot of times, especially people change can be hard for some. And I think a lot of people think if I make my family aware of what's going on, they may start policing the things that I do. Meaning, you know, if I need to cut back on sweets, you know, every time we go out to eat or every time I go to their house or every time I'm picking up anything, are they always yeah. going to be looking at my food saying, should you be eating that? Or don't, put, <laughs> don't eat this, eat that. You know, so a lot of people just don't want to be bothered with. And I think, you know, honestly, I think we all mean it out of love and we may have all done that, you know, in some form or said something like that. But I think a lot of people don't want to 
have people kind of hovering over, kind of monitoring things that they eat. Um, and I think a lot of people are sometimes embarrassed because they think that their family members or their friends may look at them differently if they find out they have high blood pressure or if mm. they find out they have diabetes or if they find out they have anything that's going on, because especially if they're the person in the family that everybody kind of goes to for everything, if they're the go-to person and they're looked at as supposed, they're supposed to have it all together. So mm -hmm. if they don't have it all together, how can I have it all together? So, you know, if they're that person in the family, I found that some of them want to keep it quiet because they don't want people to be worried about them and they want to make sure um, that people still look at them in that same light. And another reason I think that people may not want to is they just plain old don't plain old don't want to change anything. You know, they yes. they like they, they like what they like. You know, they like being able to go and come as they please, eat whatever they want, um, and what have you. So the thought of having to change something. Um, you know, can be really shocking for them and they just don't want to deal with it. But, you know, I think if people know you can make adjustments to get to your goal, it doesn't mean that, you know, you have to make a huge change overnight. And I think people, a right. lot of people think it's a cold turkey type of thing. So they're just, mm -hmm. it's like an all or nothing. Like, you know, okay, these are some things, even if it's something they can do without medicine, and it's kind of some lifestyle changes, they may not necessarily feel like doing that because they enjoy it, you know? So I think those are some things that I've seen as to why some of us have an issue with change. Yeah. And you know what? It's funny that you bring that up because our our elders are particularly the ones that are very difficult to reach <laughs> when it comes to this because they've been doing something for so long and they had it passed down by their mothers and their grandmothers and great grandmothers and, and aunties and such. And they feel like, well, this is the way we've always done it. I've heard that a million times in my own family, like, my grandmother, she is only ten, two generations removed from slavery. So there are, there is a way in which she does things and she has do, does things, done things for years because this is what was taught to her. And mm -hmm. she says to me, you know, we did things a certain way because it was simply about survival. You know, we couldn't afford, you know, certain things and certain things just wasn't available to us. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the change, that can be very difficult for our elders in particular to accept. And they set the tone ultimately for those coming behind them. Now, how do you suggest getting these very important conversations started because see, I'm a rebel. Okay. And so <laughs> I saw what my, what my grandmother was going through, some of the health issues that she currently has, some that my parents are starting to develop. And I, I'm the oldest of five and I decided, mm -hmm. you know what? I ain't got time for that. Okay. <laughs> I ain't doing that. So right. I just decided on my own that I was going to change my entire lifestyle. So I changed the lifestyle. I did it gradually, but mm -hmm. I created a lifestyle change. But they tell me that I eat like a bird. And, <laughs> and so <laughs> I don't because I eat. All right. I'm 160 pounds, y'all. So I eat, but <laughs> it's healthy for me. But how do you go about starting these very important change, these important conversations? Because oftentimes they're so stubborn and so set in their ways that they don't want to hear you. Right. So you 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 started out by saying what immediately came to my head when you asked me that question. Lead by example. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that is where you start because I found that if you are you know, constantly telling someone, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. And then they look at you and they're just like, well, what are you doing? Like, you're yeah. telling me what I need to do based on my numbers or based on the report that I got from my healthcare provider. Like, what are you doing? So I'll tell you an interesting story. So 
it ties back to my dad again. I, I tell him all the time, you are just all in my medical journey, just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, about a couple, few years ago, I had a craving for vegetables. Um, didn't want any meat. So I was just, I had this huge craving for vegetables and I was, it just came out of nowhere. And so I, I said, okay, let me just look up some different things to make eating necessary. I mean, eating veggies interesting. So, you know, I would look up recipes, look at YouTube videos and things like that. So I did vegetarian for about a week or so. And then I said, well, let me try vegan. Let me push myself a little bit further. So I actually ended up um, just going on that journey and a couple of weeks. And I would say maybe like, a month or so after that, you know, I was telling my dad what I was doing and asking him to try, to try some things. Um, I'm not a huge cook, but my mom is. So she would start preparing some different vegetarian um, dishes for him or just kind of modifying some of the things that she would normally cook, like her greens or cabbage, you know, mm. instead of putting like, you know, your pork or what yes. have you in it. She just would modify it to make it more of a vegetarian type thing. And so maybe about <clears throat> a month after that, my dad had a heart attack, um, oh, his, wow. second, his second heart attack, actually. So you can imagine, um, you know, it was a, another big hit to our family. He survived. Um, but this time he had a complete blockage in one of his arteries. So while he was in the hospital, you know, this was in the midst of a pandemic. So, you know, I had to be daughter again, couldn't go up. You know, he was in on the, the cardiology floor, ICU, all of that. Um, but he did have his phone. So I know one time I spoke with him and he said the cardiologist came around and he said, man, you know what? You just need to become a vegetarian. And so, you know, it was almost like a divine thing that had happened. It's almost like the heart attack was in the works. But even before then, it started with me showing him an example of what I was doing, him being mm. willing to try it and enjoy it based on some of the things that he already liked that my mom prepared. And hearing the cardiologist tell him that he was like, Oh, it's no problem. You know, especially after something serious like that. So I, right. I say that to say a lot of times when you will show what you're doing and sometimes show them how something that they like, how they can put a little bit of a healthy spin on it. And, you know, some things are already healthy, healthy. But if you can sometimes show that healthy doesn't necessarily have to taste bad. Or, yes. you know, getting exercise doesn't always have to hurt. I've even told people, you know, they're like, well, I don't even know what to start or how often I should start. I said, well, if you can only start with walking 10 minutes, do your 10 minutes and be consistent with that. And then once you're comfortable with your 10 minutes, start with 15 minutes. After you do that, you're comfortable with that you know, do your 20 minutes. Like it's not a one size fits all. Exactly. The, goal is, the goal is to help you to be, to get on that wellness, health and wellness journey and stick with it. It's not a, you know, where you just have to sprint there. We want you to get there and stay there once you are there. And, you know, that can look different for everybody, but, you know, do what works for you and work your way up from there. Small, I tell people, small steps still add up over time. Yes, they do, family. <laughs> so you took a, you should take a couple of things from what Dr. And Andrea said. Number one, lead by example by example, because the thing about it is, especially if you are looked at as, as a leader of sorts in your family, and there are those of us who, it doesn't matter our age, it doesn't matter whatever, we are just leaders in our family in some way, shape, or form. So remember, if you are looked at as a leader in your family, to walk by example. And number two, Start wherever you are. Meet yourself wherever you are. If you're sedentary, you're not about to jump up and start running a 5K. Okay, y'all, let's be let's be sensible. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> please. Please, don't. <laughs> please. 
days. We're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> 10 minutes. And you know, it, that's something, that's something that I've had to do myself, especially if something happens and I have to not work out for a while. Like I have lupus. And so there will be times in which, especially if I have been under a particular amount of stress and I've had a, a flare and it takes me out of my workouts for a bit. I don't just jump back into my hour yoga sessions or hour and a half. I start off with 10 minutes and then 15 and then 20. And so when you titrate yourself upward that way, it becomes something that's sustainable. That is the key. You want something sustainable because that cold turkey stuff and that just hop on it real quick, it's not going to last. It is not going to last. Mm -mm. So, what are the five most important things a person should know about their medical history? Okay, so if I there are many things, but I had to if I had to pick five, I would say definitely know your allergies because the, the your medication allergies um whether there's some herbal allergies or mm. even if it's something that you know you're like oh it just does this little bitty thing like make sure you know what that little bitty thing is so right. that you can make your doctor aware or you know whoever your medical provider is because the last thing you want to do is to seek help and then you don't tell them something um that you're allergic to and maybe you may be allergic to that thing, but then there may be something that's similar to that that can maybe give you a similar reaction. So if they know what that particular thing is that can help you. Also know all of your medications. And I tell patients to make sure you write those down because, you know, some medications look alike, sound alike, but they're different. And so safety is something that you want to make sure that you're always thinking about. And even though we have to be safe in what we're doing, we want we need your help to help us with that so that we won't do anything um, that could possibly harm you just because right. we don't. Um, also know your medical problems, even if it was something that you were diagnosed with, you know, five, 10 years ago, make sure you know those, because even though that may not be something that you're experiencing right now, it can still affect you later on. Um, also know your family history. Um, this is super important with knowing your family history, because if anything ever happens to you um, and your healthcare provider is trying to figure out, you know, what route to, to take, knowing some things that have, you know, quote unquote, running your family before can help them with figuring that out. And also with um, what particular screenings that you need based on some things that have happened in your family as well. Right. And um, if I had to pick another one, I would say know some of the surgeries or procedures that you've had before, because that can also play a role in the medical decision making with, you know, trying to figure out what else, what what is going on or some past things that have gone to a point where you needed to have a procedure or a surgery done. All of those five things can help you with trying to uh, with help your doctor with um, your medical care. Wow. You know, it's so funny because I had no idea the piece that you just told about um, prior things. So even if it's something that bothered me a while ago, that's not bothering me now, I had no idea that that's even relevant because you, you would think, well, something that happened when I was a kid that's not bothering me now as an adult is not really a big deal. And mm -hmm. I never, ever thought about that. So family is important to make sure that you are bringing that stuff up even when you think that it is not important. And the piece about allergies is super important because I've learned from personal experience that an allergy to anything can form at any time in yes. your life because <laughs> I've had some really scary experiences because an all a food allergy formed out of absolutely nowhere. And mm -hmm. the doctors told me at the time, Allergies conform to anything at any given point in time. So like you said, it is very important to take note if anything abnormal begins to happen when you're taking something in. And believe it or not, a lot of foods 
some of their ingredients or components are in medications. So it's really important to make sure that they know food allergies because you think, well, what does a food allergy have to do with medication? Um, it has a lot to do with medication. Listen, y'all, I had some scary experiences because I ain't know and didn't say something I should have said. <laughs> Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that with the foods, because I've had um, I've known some people who ha will have um, an allergy to like a specific type of red dye. And even mm -hmm. though they're not they're not allergic to a particular medication, if that medication coating um, or something with it has that particular dye that's on it, then they can't take that particular medication or certain foods they can't eat because of that dye. So mm -hmm. I always tell people it's best to just tell us everything. And that way we know that we're able to cover our bases and we can, you know, make sure that you're safe as well. Yes. So I have a question because you talk about knowing family history. Family history can sometimes be tough to get. So how would you suggest that you start to talk? Because remember, we touched on uh, our elders and there are certain things that they just feel like we just don't discuss those things. But it is very important for you and for your future generations to know the types of things that may be precursors. How do we start those conversations to get that very important information. Yeah, so I would say a first step would be to ask that person in private, especially if it's like grandma or one of the mm. more seasoned um, people in our families, because a lot of times they keep those things private. Or yes. if they are not necessarily thinking of them as private, they're just like, well, I don't want to bother my kids with this, or I don't want to bother mm -hmm. my grand my grandkids with, you know, grandmama's problems or granddaddy's problems or things like that. So, if you are able to spend some time with them um, when there when there aren't a lot of people around, or even if you're just, you know, going to the grocery store or you know your ride to church or you know what what have you, you can just kind of casually ask them, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to, you could ask, I'm trying to get on top of my health and make sure that I'm getting everything in order. And I want to meet with my doctor. So, and I want to let them know some things that may run in my family. Is there anything that you've ever been diagnosed with or that your doctor has talked to you about, talked to you about, or are there any medicines that you're taking for anything in particular so that I'll know what I need to look out for? And if there are anything um, like the elders in my family, they want to make sure those grandkids are just like taken care of. Everything mm -hmm. goes smooth with them. Or even if it's, it's, you know, if it's an older parent, you know, if you tell them, you know, you want to know what has gone on in your family so that you can make sure that, you know, you know what to look out for and what to get screened for. Sometimes they will open up, you know, when you tell them things like that. Or if you t or if you ask, well, if it hasn't happened to you, what are some things that you heard that has happened with your sister or brother or, you know, some of your kids? Um, so I'll know kind of what to look out for. And that will kind of get the conversation started. But yeah, if you just don't make a big deal out of it and just kind of casually bring it up, I think that's a better approach than, you know, just kind of making a huge deal out of it because you don't want them to kind of shut down and not share those things. Right. Um, you know, you may have to tweak the conversation a little bit different. Um, depending on who the person is, you'll know the person more. But I, I feel like just kind of making a, you know, I want to make sure I'm doing what I the best that I can to stay healthy, you know, from that approach, I think that would be a, a good thing to do. Yes, I appreciate that because, again, there are so many of us that need to have these conversations. It's so important. And so I think those are good tips and good starting points to kind of help get these conversations going because it's so important, especially in our community, to know what we are dealing with, you know, because like I said before, what you don't know about your health can hurt you. So yeah. now I saw in your um, bio that you sent to me that you are on social media. And so social media is not usually the place you'd expect to find your doctor. <laughs> 
So what made so what made you decide to join social media and start to create digital products to help your audience, to help people like myself? Well, I, I I'm not a huge social media person, but when you start looking at the gift and the purpose and the passion that I have within things, I couldn't mm-hmm. just do it within confined walls. And, you know, right. I would always get um, some family members or friends who would ask me different questions. Um, and I, you know, I started to think like, what can I do to help more than just the people that I know, you know, not you know, forming a doctor patient relationship, but it being able to share some health awareness and different things like that. And the best way that I can think of to do it um, would be to start sharing on social media. Um, And so when I started, you know, it was it was new for me. But once, you know, I started getting feedback and people were asking questions, I knew that that was a good start. um, And a good start to start helping people beyond just the clinic walls and then being able to provide certain tools, you know, like I said, trying to help families build this health legacy and to be able to keep their health organized and make it kind of a normal thing that we do as a part of our legacy. Um, You know, I've said it before, you know, when we think about leaving a legacy, a lot of times we think about just money, but we need to make sure that we incorporate those healthy habits and routines and make that a part of what we're passing on as well. You know, like you were saying, um, you were kind of the rebel and you started you know, your own health journey and making changes yourself. If we're mm-hmm. able, if, if I'm able to kind of help people with that journey with different products and tools to be able to help them along the way, I feel like that's another extension of me and how I can help us to be able to build that health legacy so that we can pass it on to the generations to come. That is so awesome. I love it. I love it. I remember when I saw it. You're welcome. I remember I saw it. I said, oh, I love this. I absolutely love this. I said, oh, digital health planners. Listen, because I am a planner person. I have a planner for everything. I love planners. I got digital ones. I got hard copies. I think I probably have about eight planners in my drawer. I've got a personal one, one for my family. I've got one for my business. I have planners for everything. They really help to keep you organized and help you stay on top of your stuff. And sometimes having things all over the place or all together, um, let me say, is not necessarily, you know, the way that you want to go. Sometimes you want to have one specifically for so you can know, hey, this is one for my health. So let me go directly to that one. So now I also saw that you were a big activist in your community with the health. So can you tell us a little bit about that initiative? So I am a part of a nonprofit that's back in my in my hometown. Um, So, you know, that is even though my parents raised me, the community was really good to me and very encouraging along the way. So being able to work with that organization to do community outreach, um, help them with some grants to be able to to create jobs in the area, um, you know, just create awareness through that. And that that part is not all about me. It's about giving back um, any resources that I'm able to come across. I can share it with them. Um, We have a clothing closet where people are welcome to come. You know, there's a need. Um, I know at one point a family, what was it, gentleman who got burned out of his, his house got burned down. So, We were able to um, help him with that. We have a food ministry where we're able to give out food um, with with that and just different things in the community to just help uplift them. And, you know, I can slide in some some health recommendations, you know, here and there as well, especially when they have different community outreach events. Um, You know, health always seems to come up. Um, And they are comfortable talking to me because number one, I grew up there. Number two, they still know my parents. So they know that, you know, they're not going to have me out here. (laughs) You know how (laughs) your community is. You're like, you know, they say it takes a village. So yes. 
So they it still, does. They still look at me the same way, and I'm happy to it. I'm so happy that I'm able to give back in that way. I donate my time. I donate my money. I donate any resources that I can connect them with just to help with that community building. Um, I'm able to do that too. So that that is one of my passions that I'm able to do because, you know, I've been busy with school for so long. I have my own family. So being able to do this and give back, um, there have been times when I've, you know, spoken at some of the churches in the different areas back home, um, some different schools, you know, whether it was a small group or talking to some seniors. So yeah. I use that as a means of giving back, encouraging, empowering, and so hopefully we'll get more people. Um, if you see someone who looks like you, um, especially in this profession, you will know that, hey, if she can do it, she's from this area. It's yes. possible for me. Um, and it, like I said, they a lot of people may not want to, to become a doctor, but knowing that you see someone who's actually done it, you know, they can ask me questions about what it's like, what do they need to do to get started. So I am there as a hometown girl to motivate, empower, reach back, and help the community that helped me along the way. I love that. I love that. And that I think that's just so important to wherever you can help uplift the community because mm -hmm. it's so important for um, our little brown girls and brown boys to see people yeah. like us in in positions where we have platforms and have the ability and resources in which to reach people that we may not normally be able to reach and be able to help them and others in our community that may be in need. So that is so important. And I positively mm -hmm. love that about you. So you. I want to ask, you're welcome. I want to ask a few questions. I always play a game with my podcast guests toward okay. the end of our show. And so I'm going to ask you some very thought provoking questions. Okay, ready? let's go. <laughs> All right. So if you were planning the ultimate holiday party, who would be on that guest list? Dead or alive? Oh, the ultimate. <laughs> Okay, so it would definitely, I spent so much time with my family. So with that, so outside of my family, I think I would want to invite someone like Tabitha Brown because she's a yes. vegan. <laughs> she's vegan. She's I um, love me some Tab, okay? <laughs> I love her. <laughs> she's vegan. Um, so, you know, I could get some tips on how we can bring mm -hmm. some things table that people would you know we could put a vegan spin on it and we can get them to try it um it will be her i would also like to bring the obamas so that they can share some of their wisdom and experience yes. as well and i think um i would also like to bring both my grandmothers back so i can so i can spend time with them yes. and we can have that time with the family as well and they can have a chance to see like hey this is what you produce you should be proud hopefully <laughs> uh, that's awesome so what would you serve like what kind of food will we be serving up in there oh, we was let's see um that's tough it's so many <laughs> Let's see. I would say probably some traditional dishes with the mm -hmm. vegan skin. I've I've done um a uh vegan mac and cheese before. Mm. I've done that. <laughs> and there I've had um mushroom that was prepared in a smothered steak kind of way. So probably that. And then, you might have to share some of these recipes because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> no, I haven't done that. I've tried that at a restaurant before. Okay. Um, and then probably uh, I would say some type of veggies, whether it be like I like cabbage, greens, mm -hmm. Brussels sprouts, mm -hmm. asparagus. So some things like that and different types of um fruity drinks. They don't have to be alcohol, but just something interesting uh, with uh, something kind of tropical. Mmm, this this sounds like a delicious holiday party. I'm hungry, y'all. <laughs> okay. All right. So question number two. 
What are the last three books you read and what did you take away from each of those reads? Okay, so I can't remember the name of this one, but it was um, a LinkedIn mastery book that was recommended mm -hmm. from someone that I saw online. Just And my reason for wanting to do that, you know, again, I was talking about being able to reach out to the mm -hmm. community and different people. Um, so that that kind of helped me with that. Um, there, interesting enough, there was another book on investing. So, you know, thinking about legacy building, health yes. is one portion. So wealth is something that I want to be able to learn more about from the investing standpoint to pass yes. that on as well. Um, and then um, it wasn't a recent one, but one that I really liked, the Sarah Jakes Don't Settle for Less. Um, okay. It kind of, kind of walked me through my some of the things I've experienced um, yeah. and just to keep going. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you one that I just recently read was um, Hurricane Summer. That book was so good. It was so <laughs> amazing it was that book was so good like when the book ended i didn't want it to end like i had become addicted to this book okay and like when it was over i was like wait there's got to be more there's got to be more <laughs> but there wasn't but it was so good awesome 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 book um tabitha brown's book i don't know if you've read it it's on my list Oh, you're going to love it. I'm not going to spoil it, but you are going to love it. I have the audible version and she reads it. She's really? the narrator. Oh my goodness. Like I was so caught up in that book as well. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've listened to that book over and over and over. I absolutely love her. I love her so very, very much. I love her realness. I love her down the earthness. I love her just living truly in herself and, and like, listen, you're going to take me the way I am or you're not going to take me at all. And that is all. And I love it. <laughs> I'm here for all of it. And I want to say the third book I read was something called Marketing Warfare. Okay. Um, I forgot the name of the authors, but they discuss, they talk about marketing and they talk about it in the standpoint of using the war. They use the Civil War. They use the um, World War II as points of reference to compare it to today's marketing and how it fits. It's such an inter interesting That's read. Interesting. Yeah. So anybody who's in business, I would definitely suggest that. It's an excellent, excellent read. That also in the four hour work week, like I read a lot of books. I love, love, love books. I love to read. So that's one of the reasons why I asked that question. Um, <laughs> um, so what do you on my list? Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Yes. Yes. So what was the last movie you saw? Um, what was the last? I, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about I, honesty. I, I usually fall asleep on movies, but my husband <laughs> went to, I can't remember the um, the name of it. It was by Jordan Peele. I won't give all the details, but it's it's the family that had the horses and a lot of things happened with it. I can't remember. It's, it was a few weeks ago. Um, I can't Is remember. Is it Nope? Yes, 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 okay, yes. Okay, it yeah, don't give it away because I haven't seen it yet. No, that was the lab. We went to see that. So I won't okay. give it away. <laughs> okay, yeah, don't give it away. Doesn't get doesn't tell you even half of the story. So yeah. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I, listen, I can imagine. You know, I the I don't even remember the last movie I saw. It was I, I don't know what it was. It was probably something on Disney Plus or something with the kids. But I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. But I know um, the one I'm looking forward to seeing is I want to see the um the one with Viola Davis, the new one. Yes, yes, yes. I cannot wait. I'm I am forward to that one. <laughs> I'm holding with bated breath, but I also want to see um Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul, because that movie yes. looked like it's gonna be so funny. Yes, extremely <laughs> funny. So those those are two, but definitely the one with Viola Davis. I saw the trailer yes. for it. And I was like, you know, when she was talking about how her body just went through so much with the transformation, mm -hmm. 
you know, preparing for it and just to see like what they were doing. I'm like, okay, this is going to like make everybody want to go out there and just get yes. their bodies. <laughs> yes. I, I just love Viola Davis as well. She's another one that is just so in her realness. She is just so accepting of herself and who she is and the way, just the way that she is. And she just is not really worrying about what anybody else has to say. And that realness is what draws people to her and is one of the things that makes her so, so successful. I absolutely love her. She's another one of my, she's my auntie in my head, but that's another story. <laughs> What was your last vacation experience? Because I saw that you said you love to travel. Yes. So my last vacation experience was in Aruba for my birthday. Nice. Um, I went on a mini vacation with some friends from college um, mm -hmm. back in June. We went to Charleston. But the last big one that I really liked was less than a year ago was when I went to Aruba. And I love... Um, I, you know, a lot of people, I work hard, but I really love rest and relaxation yes. and like beautiful places. So that's, um, at least one, that's at least once a year when I know I'm going to be able to get away and, you know, just take in all the elements. I love yes. to get an oceanfront room so I can wake up and just, sometimes I don't even turn the TV on. I just listen yes. to the ocean and it's just, I love it. So what was that travel like um, since COVID? So we, I think, was it right before they lifted the mat? No, everybody still had to wear masks. So it okay. actually was, it wasn't that bad, um, especially, you know, at this point, because, you know, it was just wearing a mask has just become like another piece of clothing since, <laughs> you know, yes. since we, it's been a part of us for so long. Yes. Um, so it wasn't that, that bad for me. And the flight um, was maybe four, four hours or so from Florida. So it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Um, and then once, and then, you know, everybody had to take their precautions and you mm. had to do your testing and everything before. And then once we left um, the island as well, we had to take a test coming back. So I, okay. felt, I felt really safe because I knew what everybody had to do beforehand and what you had to do coming back. So we still wore a mask on the plane, um, but mm. I felt really safe at the resort and on the hotel and in the airport as well. Nice. That's good to know because I know that right now with travel, everybody's experience is different. And mm -hmm. because it kind of seems like everybody's just kind of doing their own thing, like kind of whatever they feel like. Some people want you to wear masks. Some people don't. Some people want you vaccinated. Some people don't care. Some people want right. to test. And so it's really interesting. I really enjoy hearing different perspectives about travel because yes. it's just so different, like everywhere you go. But it's good to know <laughs> that you felt safe, you know, as a doctor. It's good to know that you felt safe yes. because I'm planning to do some travel later this year <laughs> i was a little nervous but once i knew of all the checkpoints and things that you had to do mm. prior and on your back that gave me more comfort okay all right mm -hmm. good to know all right last question what okay. are three things on your bucket list huh <laughs> Let's see. um one thing I want to do is to go with my family to Africa. That's one big thing on my bucket list. Um, another thing I want to do um, is to buy a huge RV so that I can travel around the United States. And not that I can't fly and go different places, but I just want to be able to have that experience as well. Um, and I don't know if this is a bucket list thing, but something I really want to do is to have a tiny house. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my goodness. It can, be, it can be one of those ones that, have you seen the ones that you can um, like hook up and like move to different places? I, honestly, if I had one, it probably would be in the country near my parents just to have my own little getaway or somewhere, somewhere yes. like that. But I wouldn't mind having like a tiny house and I love decor. So it would be like modern and all these nice yes. elements to it too. So that yes. would be something that I would just love to have just kind of like my own fun thing. You listen, y'all, I don't know if you guys know what tiny houses are, but listen, you will be so shocked about those things. There's a show, I think it's on HGTV. 
Uh-huh. It's called tiny. Is it called tiny house? Uh-huh. It's tiny houses. <laughs> Listen, guys, you're, you're like your mouth will just drop open at these little houses. So I definitely know exactly what she's talking about. Now, listen, my family is a little too big for a tiny house because I don't know how all of us, all six, all six or seven of us, is gonna get in there, like, and then grandkids, and then and then dogs and stuff. I, listen, uh, I don't think we can do tiny house living. <laughs> Full time, just as an option <laughs> here and there. But I just would like to have one. So when I want that experience, you know, you can create all create all these little tiny mm-hmm. compartments and things like that. So I think it'd yeah, be fun. I think that would be cool. I think that would be cool. I really do. I really, really do. I think that would be so awesome. And I'm telling you, these are some of the most beautiful houses that you ever want to see. So mm-hmm. if you guys get a chance, check that show out because that show is so fun. So finally. We have had such an amazing conversation. I enjoyed this so, so much. Now share with the audience how they can reach out to you if they would like to connect with you. How can they find you? So I am at Dr. Andrea W. on all social media platforms. And that's at, and that's D-R-A-N-D-R-E-I-A-W. And then on TikTok, I am at Dr. Andrea W. And the it's D-O-C-T-O-R-A-N-D-R-E-I-A-W. Awesome. Awesome. And my website, I forgot. My website <laughs> is www.drandreaw.com. Uh, it's all good no rush no rush (laughs) listen family i hope that you guys enjoyed this episode as much as i did this was absolutely awesome thank you so much for joining us dr andrea and listen family you all know i love y'all to life thank you all so much for listening thank you for sharing Thank you for being a part of the Melanin Wellness Podcast family. Until next time, live well, family.